Today, I'm going to beat Pokemon Yellow with the best starter Pokemon. Do not try to change my mind. So sit back, relax, and enjoy this solo challenge featuring the original grass type starter. Playthrough rules can be found in the description. Also, the goal here on my channel is to rank every Pokemon in solo challenge tier lists. So by the end of the video, I think that we're going to have some good data for Bulbasaur. Let's start things off by talking about it as a Pokemon. For base stats, it has 45 HP, 49 attack and defense, 65 special, and 45 speed, giving it an 8.59% chance to crit in Generation 1. Like all starter Pokémon, it has a medium-slow growth rate. This is the best for solo challenges because it levels up very quickly in the early game. In terms of a move pool, Bulbasaur is sort of a mixed bag. It functions like every other grass type in Generation 1. They get primarily grass and normal type moves, with very little, if any, coverage. Through level up, Bulbasaur starts with Tackle and Growl, and then it gets Leech Seed, Vine Whip, Poison Powder, Razor Leaf, Growth, Sleep Powder, and Solar Beam. Honestly, some fantastic moves. It's a bit annoying that Leech Seed and Vine Whip aren't reversed. Learning Vine Whip at level 7 would be much more useful for the early game when the first major hurdle is Brock. Razor Leaf is a high critical hit ratio move, and if you have more than 64 speed, it will always get a critical hit. With Bulbasaur's 45 speed, this is going to give it about a 70% chance to crit when using Razor Leaf. Growth Increase is special by one stage, so it's pretty good in Generation 1, also considering that it triggers the badge boost glitch. I'll talk about that more later on when it becomes relevant to the run. Sleep Powder of course is fantastic, it has 75% accuracy, making it the second most accurate sleep move in the game, tied with Lovely Kiss. If if you didn't know, in Generation 1, when a Pokémon wakes up from sleep, they cannot move, so you have the chance, if you outspeed, to put them back to sleep, preventing them from ever attacking. And finally, I don't think Solar Beam is going to be useful today, after all weather effects were introduced starting in Generation 2. Through TM and HM, Bulbasaur might not get access to very many moves, but the ones it does get are very useful. Swords Dance, Body Slam, and Mega Drain. All three of those moves are obviously going to see play today, so now with all of that out of the way, let's talk about my first playthrough. Over the last year and a half, I have really standardized the structure of my videos. I start with my first playthrough, summarize the results from it, and then go into my most optimized playthrough, showing you how to fix all of the problems that occurred during the first run. First of all, for all of you, I really care about storytelling, and I think this makes the better story, rather than just showing you an optimized run right away. Second, I think it's really interesting to see what happens when I am unprepared for the Pokemon, and then contrast that result against something that is very planned out and optimized. I don't usually talk about these things at the beginning of my videos, but I suspect that maybe a few extra new viewers will trickle in to watch this video. So if you're new, welcome, it's great to have you. Now let's start talking about my strategy for Bulbasaur in the first run. When filming this on August 29th, I knew that Bulbasaur could defeat Brock on minimum battles. That being said, the chance for that is not very likely. I'll waste both real time and have a lot of reset if I attempt that strategy. Plus then on Route 3 my progress is going to be significantly slowed down. The decision I made was to train in the forest against the bug catchers and then the junior trainer in Brock's gym to level Bulbasaur up to level 13 where it learns Vine Whip. I faced three of the bug catchers and a total of 13 wild Pokemon, bringing Bulbasaur to level 12. Then against the junior trainer in Brock's gym, when I knock out his Diglett, Bulbasaur grows to level 13, learns Vine Whip, and one-shots the Sandshrew. Okay, so now I am expecting to completely smash Brock. Bulbasaur outspeeds the Geodude, goes for Vine Whip, and knocks it out in a single hit. You can notice that I am very confident in this fight because I didn't heal before it. Bulbasaur levels up to level 14, unfortunately getting only to 22 speed, meaning the Onyx is going to move first. If it spammed Bind continuously I would lose, but it goes for Tackle, allowing me to hit with Vine Whip and knock it out in a single turn. With that, Bulbasaur clocks in with its very first split of 7 minutes and 2 seconds. For a Grass-type Pokémon this is pretty slow, but I did have to train to level 13. Also, I'll note here at every split I collect four pieces of major data. I collect the real time, the resets, the level, and the game time. In my ranking system, I rank Pokemon exclusively based on real time, but I do consider the other metrics if I have to break ties. So with Brock out of the way, now I have to go on to Route 3, and this area is largely why I thought the training in Viridian Forest was going to be a good idea. The first example comes right away against this bug catcher. He has three Pokemon on his team, two Caterpie and one Weedle. With Bulbasaur, my best damage dealing move here is Tackle. That's kind of unfortunate because it's 95% accurate, and it uses Bulbasaur's lower offensive stat. That is, even with Brock's badge boost, which is calculated in all the stats that you see in the bottom left. 
It takes me three turns to knock the Caterpie out, so this is slow going. However, there is a way for it to be sped up, kind of ironically. If the Weedle uses String Shot on Bulbasaur, while it does lower my speed, it triggers the badge boost glitch, causing the 12.5% boost to my attack stat to compound on top of my already calculated attack stat. So you can see here that my attack jumps up from 28 to 31. Being hit by another string shot compounds this again, and that allows me to two-shot the final Caterpie. However, the slog of this route is not done yet, because the very next trainer, while he does have a Rattata which I can knock out quickly with two Vine Whips, he also has an Ekans, and this thing can really slow the battle down by using Wrath. It's a trapping move, I can't attack if it chooses to go for it, however, I get lucky in this fight and it doesn't use it. I have to choose which trainer I face next, either the Bug Catcher or the Lass. In this case I'm going to fight the Lass, just because Bulbasaur going up against a Kakuna and a Metapod does not sound like a quick endeavor. I can defeat her Rattata and Nidoran much faster, go back to Pewter City to reset her position, and continue with the route. For the sake of brevity, which is overall something I am not known for, I'm not going to show you the last battle on this route. I'm just going to summarize by saying that overall in the early game, Bulbasaur struggles to get through fights quickly. Its attacking moves are just not particularly good against the plentiful bug, poison, and flying types. In Mount Moon, because I trained a decent amount for Brock, I fight only two optional trainers, the Super Nerd and then the Hiker. They're both pretty quick and give good experience. After that, I have to face the mandatory Super Nerd, who is quite slow as you would expect because he has two Poison-type Pokemon. I make the correct choice, selecting the Dome Fossil, and then I have to go up against Jesse and James, who once again are very slow, and this fight is definitely the first one where Bulbasaur is sweating. I have to use Leech Seed on the Coughing to slowly gain back health, just because my health is getting so low. I'm not doing very much damage, and the Coughing is doing about 6 with each hit from Smog. Luckily this move is pretty inaccurate so Bulbasaur does pull through, but it was way closer than I initially expected it would be. In Cerulean City of course there is no choice, I'm gonna fight Misty first, but before that I fight the optional swimmer in her gym for a little bit of extra experience. Then I have to take on the pecking Goldeen trainer, and like her name suggests, her Goldeen has Peck, which is a flying type move, so when it uses it, it does a decent amount to Bulbasaur. Then to conserve Vine Whip PP, I use Tackle, which does not knock the Goldeen out. Why did the developers give Vine Whip 10 PP and Razor Leaf 25? It makes absolutely no sense. Because I was trying to manage my PP so that I could last against Misty, the Goldeen confuses Bulbasaur, it hits itself, doing a lot, I take more damage from Peck. Bulbasaur hits itself again, surviving on only 6 hit points. Luckily, Goldeen goes for Tail Whip. Okay, if I hit myself again though, I am going to lose. Bulbasaur doesn't, and the Goldeen faints. That was another very close battle. But don't worry, Misty is next, and I'm sure this one is not going to be close. One downside of Bulbasaur is the fact that it's quite slow. I'm not even moving first against the Staryu. Misty's AI modification 3 forces her to use Tackle against my Pokemon, which is doing almost nothing to Bulbasaur even when it gets a critical hit. Her lead goes down over two turns, and then she sends in Starmie. She uses an X Defend right away, Vine Whip does about a quarter, Starmie uses Harden, my next Vine Whip takes it to orange health, it strikes back with Tackle, and yeah, it's doing almost nothing, so Bulbasaur has earned itself an easy second badge. The next major battle is against the rival on Nugget Bridge, I have to do this if I want to progress with the playthrough. His lead Pokemon is Spiro, and it's quite strong against Grass types because it knows the move Peck. The Flying type resists Grass type moves, so my best choice here is to use Tackle. Spiro fails Alir, which is great because the next move it uses is Peck, which does about a third. I take it down to a sliver of health, it successfully pulls off Alir, and then I knock it out. With it out of the way, the rest of the fight should be significantly easier. Santru is next, but I have super effective damage in the form of Vine Whip, and it is not known for its high special. Plus, Bulbasaur gets a critical hit, so I don't have to worry about sand attacks in this run. The Rattata that's next is a one hit with Vine Whip, leaving only his Eevee, but this thing is only really scary if his former Pokemon have got you into a really bad position. Now, as I move on to Nugget Bridge, I want to talk about the concept of gameplay loops. I think the best way to think about it is that there is some sort of challenge that you have to do, like battles, then there is a reward from the battles, perhaps getting experience or learning a new move, maybe getting an evolution if you are not doing a solo challenge like I am doing, and then after that, there is some sort of anticipation of the next challenge. So as a player, you are constantly going from challenge to reward to anticipation. Within the solo challenges that I do, I feel like this loop 
loop plays out on a very macroscopic level. For instance, on Nugget Bridge, I am typically anticipating the next challenge, which is either the rival on the SSN or Lieutenant Surge. Um, I realize that that is a very weird statement because both of those trainers are not really that much of a challenge, but for the sake of this point, let's assume they could be challenging. During the time fighting all of these random trainers, I am trying to think of my strategies for those trainers. Then once I get to them, I have the challenge, I defeat them, and I get some kind of reward, which hopefully is a good split time. Then I go back to anticipation of the next major battle. Sometimes after the reward, which again is my split, during the anticipation step, I will heal my Pokemon or use a couple items, perhaps a TM, something like that. With Bulbasaur though, I really feel that this gameplay loop is being emphasized on the most microscopic level. Each individual early game trainer feels like a mini challenge. There is usually some kind of reward, like leveling up and gaining a little bit more stats to make the next one slightly easier, or at least to keep the difficulty at the same level. And then, in anticipation of the next battle, I'm going to use an item as well as likely save. You can see that here as I go up against a Zubat on Nugget Bridge. This thing is terrifying for Bulbasaur. Not only can it cause confusion with Supersonic, but I can also use Leech Life, which in Generation 1 does 4 times damage to Grass Poison types. Because the bug type is super effective, against the poison type. Yeah, the bug and the poison type are a little bit weird in this game because they deal super effective damage to each other. This is an interaction that was removed starting in generation 2. I just barely make it through this fight with Zubat at 3 hit points, and the amount of damage this thing did to me emphasizes this gameplay loop even more. I'm gonna have to go back to the Pokemon Center to heal because I have run out of healing items at this point in the run. I continue attempting Nugget Bridge hoping that I'll be able to move to the more macroscopic gameplay loop, but unfortunately Bulbasaur is not able to do it. I have to backtrack to the town again, and this time I stop by the Mart to buy more potions. At the end of the bridge there is a Rocket who also has a Zubat. Luckily this one causes no problems for Bulbasaur. Charmander, another one of the starters, is my first HM user. By the way, there will be a Charmander video tomorrow, so stay tuned for that if you're curious how the Fire-type starter will deal with Pokemon Yellow. After completing Nugget Bridge, I have to face the rocket outside of Cerulean City, and once again, another aspect of this gameplay loop is that before trainers, I usually have to save. This fight could go wrong specifically because the drowsy knows hypnosis and confusion. If it puts Bulbasaur to sleep, then it can use confusion to deal 4 times damage to knock me out very quickly. That being said, I have done some additional training, so my Bulbasaur levels up to 27 and can learn Razor Leaf before the drowsy comes out. Just a quick reminder, because this move has a high critical hit rate, it is going to crit 70% of the time when Bulbasaur uses it. Do note that it has 95% accuracy, so it's about a 65% chance that I actually hit and get a critical hit. In this case, I don't turn 1, Drowsy goes for Disable, which just disables Tackle. By the way, it randomly selects in Generation 1, so that's why I didn't disable Raise Relief. My second hit gets a crit, and with that, I no longer have to fear the Drowsy. But things don't immediately get better for Bulbasaur, because on the next route I have to face Sandy, she's this trainer who has three Pidgeys. They love to use Sand Attack, it's really frustrating, especially if they get set up early on into the fight. In this case though, they just keep attacking me with Gust and Quick Attack. By the way, Gust is a normal type move in Generation 1. Even without it, they're able to do a lot of damage to Bulbasaur. Tackle is three hitting, and that's where I want to draw your attention to a small mistake that I'm making in this run. I should be using Razor Leaf against these flying types. If you check in the top left, my overlay is calculating the effective power of every move. Tackle has an effective power of 35, whereas Razor Leaf has an effective power of 41. So it will be doing more damage to the Pidgeys, and that's when it's not critting. By the way, my overlay is displaying Razor Leaf's power without the critical hit modifier, just because Bulbasaur isn't guaranteed to get a critical hit with the move. Despite my mistake, Bulbasaur is able to pull through this fight with red health. Inside the SSN, I grab the TM for Rest, this is the safe way to play in first playthroughs. Then I pick up the TM for Body Slam and teach it to Bulbasaur right away in the place of Tackle. This is a far better normal type move. After that, I continue fighting Pokemon that Bulbasaur is weak to. The gentleman that blocks the rare candy has two fire types, so here Body Slam is my go-to move. And finally, I'm starting to build some momentum because I'm able to one-shot the Growlithe, although not the Ponyta. But Bulbasaur's special stat means that it survives the Ember and I still win. I grab the rare candy, and now I'm ready to prepare for the rival. Once again, having to heal and save before the battle because his first Pokemon is a Spearow that knows Peck. This fight is typically easy if you have gained access to new moves moves by this point in the run, and in this case I have both Body Slam and Razor Leaf. I one-shot the Spearow with the former move, and one-shot the Rattata and the Sandshrew with the latter. 
Eevee has lower defense than special, but I went for Razor Leaf just in case I crit, and I do, knocking it out in a single turn. With that out of the way, it is time to take on the man, the myth, the legend, the worst gym leader in all of Kanto, it's Lieutenant Surge. The Raichu starts the fight off using Growl, which doesn't matter because my Body Slam gets a critical hit. Then Surge uses an X Speed. I continue using Body Slam just in case it paralyzes. It doesn't. Raichu does very little damage with Thunderbolt because he doesn't have AI Modification 3, so he has no idea what moves he should be using. So it's a third easy gym victory for the Grass type. It's worth reflecting on that for a moment, because all of the random trainer battles have been very slow and annoying, but Bulbasaur hasn't really gone up against any major trainers that have been a threat to it. And that leads us to the Wrapping Lass. She's actually a junior trainer, and I just never looked at the text in the game when I named her initially on this channel, so oops. Anyways, yeah, she's the Wrapping Lass. It's because she loves to paralyze your Pokémon and then wrap them to death with Bellsprout once their speed has been cut. It is absolutely infuriating. I played this run quite a while ago, and I get paralyzed right away, but I continue to try the battle despite the fact that resetting early on is likely the best choice so that I am not paralyzed when the bell sprout come out. Luckily for me, she does not have AI Modification 3. If she did, she would just spam wrap endlessly with the Bellsprout, and there would be no path to victory. In this case, because I have a status condition and she has AI Modification 1, she is randomizing between Growth and Wrap. For those who don't know, AI Modification 1 just prevents the trainer from using a status-inflicting move when your Pokémon has a non-volatile status condition. As you can see, the Bellsprout went for Growth, so I was able to knock it out and move on to the second Oddish. This one is just going to spam Absorb now, and I can knock it out in two hits, moving on to her final bell sprout. It starts things off trapping me in wrap, but then goes for growth and I finish it off. Okay, not bad, I lost very little time there. And with that win, at long last, it is time to rejoice because Bulbasaur's progress is going to speed up. It matches up so much better against the trainers in the next section of the game. The obvious example is the Pokemaniac just inside of Rock Tunnel's entrance. He has a Cubone and a Slowpoke, so Razor Leaf is super effective. By the way, my community has nicknamed him the Slowbone Trainer. Also, he could be called Bone Slow. There's also three other possible names for him, maybe Q-Poke, Bone Poke, or Poke Bone. I think combining these two Pokemon's names is endlessly hilarious. After arriving in Celadon City in the Rocket Hideout, I'm going to collect items to hopefully make the playthrough just a little bit easier on Bulbasaur. This area accomplishes this in two ways. Number one, I can collect high-priced items to buy more vitamins in the department store, and number two, I get access to an additional rare candy. After that, I dig out and head to the department store where I buy five Carbos. Raising Bulbasaur's speed makes the most sense because it is not fast, and the mid-game is not kind to slow poison types in yellow version. One or two key out speeds can really change the course of a run. Following the department store, I make what I consider to be a mistake by going to Erica's gym next. I fight two optional trainers, then the mandatory trainer with the execute, and then I go up against Erica, which is honestly not advisable. Right here, I just want to draw your attention to the fact that Bulbasaur is a poison type and it learns no damage dealing poison type moves. I find that very interesting. I think the developers gave Bulbasaur the poison type specifically to make it better defensively. While it does make it weak to bug and psychic, it's at least neutral against ground type threats, and it also takes way less damage from opponents that are using grass and poison moves specifically. There are so many trainers in the mid game that have poison type damage, with Erica being being one of them. For a player who chooses Bulbasaur as their starter, they're not going to have to worry about these battles and taking super effective damage from any of these threats. In this case, the Poison type is helping me out against Erica because the Tangela is just going to spam moves like Constrict and Bind. The downside to that is that I have my speed lowered, so now I'm going to be slower than the Weeping Bell, and then at the last moment Tangela lowers my speed again, so I'm slower than the Gloom too. Bulbasaur levels up to level 34, and here it can learn Growth. I make an objective mistake here, teaching it in the place of Vine Whip. I should have taught this move in the place of Poison Powder, because Poison in Generation 1 is kind of a useless status. Weeping Bell is next, and this is where things get very scary. Using Acid it's doing decent damage, plus it can lower my defense stat. Can you imagine how much harder this fight would be if Bulbasaur wasn't a poison type? I managed to finish the Weeping Bell off, she sends in Gloom, it hits Acid, taking Bulbasaur down to red health. I use Body Slam, which does a third, and the Gloom uses one more Acid, causing my first reset. 
I'll fight Erica later at a higher level. For now, I'll just fight the cool trainer who gives good experience yields, learn growth again, in this case in the place of poison powder. So that reset was useful in some ways, I was at least able to correct a small mistake that I made in the fight. Logically, the only other thing that I can do at this stage in the game is fight the rival in Pokemon Tower. You'd think his Fira would be scary, but the only flying type move it knows is Mirror Move, so it reflects Body Slam back doing decent damage, but I finish it off. Razor Leaf one hits the Magnemite, the Shelter, and the Sandshrew. His ace, Eevee, is not very good. I don't get a crit, so I have to knock it out over two turns. But overall, not a difficult fight. You know what is a difficult fight, though? The fight against Agatha Jr. She's this mandatory Chandler who has two Ghastly, and because Razor Leaf, even with a crit, cannot knock the Ghastly out in a single turn, I'm gonna have to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with these things, and they love inflicting statuses. Lick paralyzes, and Confuse Ray to just frustrate you even more. I make it to the second Ghastly. This is where I get confused. Bulbasaur hits itself not once, but twice, allowing the second Ghastly to polish me off. With Pokemon that don't know a move like Dig or Psychic or have an incredibly high special attack with a move like Razor Leaf or Thunderbolt, this fight can be a challenge. Luckily for me, I only have one reset because I defeat her on my next attempt. Against Jesse and James, Bulbasaur's poison typing is once again a defensive boon. The most powerful move that they have on their team is Weezing Sludge, and while it does do a lot of damage, primarily because my defense is at minus two, it does significantly less than if Bulbasaur was a mono grass type. Because of this typing alone, I am able to win on my first attempt without a reset. Clearing Pokemon Tower opens up the game for me, I head through Cycling Road fighting no optional trainers, and that leads me through the Safari Zone to Saffron City where I go to the Fighting Dojo. I used to think this was one of the best areas to train because of how concentrated all of the experience is in one small location, there's very little walking time, and most of the Pokemon give decent experience yields. That being said, in recent times I'm definitely unraveling that logic. This is not one of the best areas to train in the game. You really only want to come here if you are desperate for more experience. With Bulbasaur, this is not only inefficient, it is also risky. Against the final Black Belt's Hitmonlee, it does a lot of damage because of a Meditate boosted Rolling Kick. I finish it off, next is Hitmonchan, which goes for Fire Punch. Razor Leaf fails to crit, so the Hitmonchan survives, goes for Fire Punch again, and Bulbasaur faints. Okay, that's not good. In the next fight, you'll notice that I remembered the gameplay loop and I healed my Bulbasaur, which seems to be what you need to do in front of almost every fight in the early game. I had gotten complacent by this point, because things have been a little bit easier against random trainers. This time against the Hitmonchan, I get a critical hit, so it goes down and Bulbasaur earns its revenge. Sylph is the next area of the game, and it's going to open a lot of strategic choices to Bulbasaur. That's because here, I can pick up the TM for Swords Dance. An interesting factoid in Generation 1 is that every grass type learns this move through TM, with the notable exceptions of Execute and Executor. I guess the developers were thinking that grass type Pokemon could use Blades of Grass to do a Swords Dance. At least that's my best attempt to make this make logical sense. Bulbasaur also gets access to another moveset upgrade here. I defeat this Hypno, which is actually a pretty close fight, and then Bulbasaur levels up to 41, where it can learn Sleep Powder. This I put in the place of Vine Whip, and now I have to make a choice. For the next section of the game, do I want to use Growth, or do I want to use Sword Stance? In Generation 1, 2, and 3, all Grass-type moves deal special damage, and all Normal-type moves deal physical damage. Therefore, Growth is going to be useful with Grass-type moves, and Sword Stance is going to be useful with Body Slam. This is a slightly reductive way to think about it though, because there is another difference. Growth can be used six times, whereas Sword Stance can only be used three times. Each time one of these moves is used, it correctly recalculates the primary stat that it is targeting, and incorrectly causes badge boosts to occur in all of your other stats, provided that you have the gym badges required to boost that stat. So while Growth sets up slower, it can badge boost more, whereas Sword Stance sets up more quickly, but it badge boosts less. The final factor here is that using Growth will not boost the damage of Razor Leaf in the case that Razor Leaf gets a critical hit. In Generation 1, whenever you crit, it ignores all stat changes, even beneficial ones that your Pokemon currently has. Also in Generation 1, I know I say that phrase a lot because these games are so unique from the rest of the Pokemon series, I'm very sorry. Anyways, also in Generation 1, critical hits do not do a flat 2 times damage. Instead, the multiplier is calculated based on your Pokemon's current level, and the multiplier is always lower than 2. If Sword Stance gives you plus 2 attack, it doubles your attack stat, effectively doubling your damage. This means if I get a critical hit with Razor Leaf, it will be doing less damage than a Razor Leaf boosted by 2 growths. 
Remember, Bulbasaur has a 70% chance to crit when it uses Razor Leaf, so this move does not pair very well with Growth. I could have kept Vine Whip instead, but I think that that's not a good choice. Instead, Growth can be paired with Mega Drain a little bit later on into the playthrough. For now, I'm just going to rely on Direct Damage and the power of Sleep Powder to defeat the rival in Sylph. The first Pokemon on his team is a Sandslash. I figured that I would one hit with Razor Leaf, but it doesn't crit and the Sandslash just barely survives. It goes for Poison Sting. Now, I didn't quite clue into the fact that it is always going to go for this move, so I just knock it out without trying to set up. Next is Cloyster. I also expected to knock it out with Razor Leaf, but it survives, uses Aurora Beam, and does massive damage before it goes down. Since things have not gone my way to this point in the fight, I put the Magneton to sleep, and I'm going to set up with Growth. After all, if you look at my speed stat, which is 71, and then the Cadaver speed stat, which is 84, it is going to move first against Bulbasaur. By raising my special as much as is possible, I am ensuring that two things happen. Number one, I am badge boosting my attack stat, which is going to help me knock out the Magneton a little bit easier, and I am also minimizing damage from all special moves for the rest of the fight, against both the Kadabra and the Flareon who have super effective damage against my Grass Poison type. I finish the Magneton off, taking a tiny bit of damage in the process. Bulbasaur levels up, this cancels out all of its badge boosts, but I still have my special boost because this is an intended boost. Kadabra goes for Confusion, Bulbasaur shrugs it off, and Body Slam does not get the one hit. But it does cause Paralysis, meaning I move first and finish the Psychic type off. All that remains is Flareon, I put it to sleep, it wakes up, I was a little bit sloppy here just continuing to attack in. Luckily it misses a Fire Spin and Bulbasaur takes the win. Up next is Jesse and James. I'm mentioning this just because the Weezing does have Sludge, and you might wonder how the fight goes. Well, it's pretty easy, especially because the Weezing comes first rather than last. Next is Giovanni, another fight that I rarely talk about just because he's usually extremely simple. Today with Bulbasaur, I get a bit unlucky with Sleep Powder against the Nidorino, and then the Persian does a lot of damage. Luckily, the following Rhyhorn is free, but the Nidoqueen isn't because it does no Body Slam. In this case, the stars have aligned and Bulbasaur has one more speed, so it can move first, and whenever that's the case, Sleep Powder is an easy counter. I put Nidoqueen to sleep and finish it off slowly with four uses of Body Slam. Inside of the Fuchsia City Gym, I'm going to mention why I came here first rather than facing Sabrina next. I don't think that Bulbasaur has a good chance against her just because it isn't outspeeding any of her Pokemon. When the Abra is moving first, things feel really bad, and once I defeat Koga, I am going to get a speed boost, which will hopefully improve my odds against her as well as Blaine. Plus, I can use Sleep Powder in combination with Growth to set up badge boosts for my speed to improve it against later Pokemon in the fight that I'm more worried about. To get to Koga, I have to make it through two jugs and they can be scary if your Pokemon is not good against Psychic types. That being said, I think I've overhyped the first juggler in the past. His Drowsies are really not that good. Their best same type move is Confusion, and other than that, they have Disable and Poison Gas, two truly awful moves, and Headbutt, which is decent, but Drowsy doesn't have good attack. The Pokemon here I am most worried about, of course, is the Kadabra, because it does outspeed Bulbasaur. Here's the thing though, the game is really in favor of Bulbasaur right now because it levels up, getting exactly 76 speed after the first Drowsy, meaning I move first against the Kadabra and one-shot it. There is one more juggler and his first Drowsy knows the move Psychic. I don't one-hit, luckily it uses Confusion, Bulbasaur hangs on, and with that I have made it to Koga. Okay, this fight should be fairly simple. The strategy is straightforward. Put the Venonats to sleep since Bulbasaur outspeeds, set up growth so the psychic moves are dealing less damage, and then sweep his team. Although things don't exactly go according to plan, I miss my first sleep powder as well as my second one, and then the Venonat uses Psychic, which lowers my special right away. I miss another sleep powder. You'll note here that the Venonat is using Toxic because it's not checking my poison type, it just checks the poison type move against my grass type and goes, yeah, that's super effective, I should definitely do that. No, Koga, that's a bad idea. Therefore, I have the time I need to eventually get sleep powder off and start setting up with growth. I get set up to plus 5, the Venonat wakes up, I try to re-establish sleep to complete my setup, Bulbasaur misses, and then the Venonat crits with Psychic, bypassing my beneficial stat changes, and so Bulbasaur is left with only red health. I want everyone to be aware of the fact that the Venomoth is definitely going to move first. This is likely going to be a loss. Because I figured I had lost, I just go for Body Slam, seeing how much damage it will do. 
and the answer is not enough. Venonet hits another Psychic, taking Bulbasaur down to two hit points, and then I finish his lead off. Watching this footage back, I'm not really sure why I continued playing. I put the next Venonet to sleep and knock it out with two uses of Body Slam. I also put the third one to sleep and knock it out with two uses of Body Slam. So I have made it to the Venomoth, and now it is gonna knock me out. But instead, it goes for Toxic, doing nothing. I put it to sleep, and I'm able to get two Body Slams off and defeat Koga. I cannot believe this fight. Things went so badly at the beginning, and then everything turned around for Bulbasaur. Now that I'm level 45, I head back to face Erika. This one is going to be really easy. Body Slam 3 hits the Tangela, next is Weepin' Bell, which gets 2 shot. Acid is doing so much less now. Last is her Gloom, and I get a lucky critical hit. While this badge doesn't give me anything useful, the prize for the fight is Mega Drain, and this is a grass type move that does not have a high critical hit ratio, so I can teach it in the place of Razor Leaf and now benefit from the stat boosts growth provides. Next I surf south to Cinnabar Island to complete Pokemon Mansion. By the way, I am not showing you mansion footage, instead I'm showing you surfing footage, just because the red checkered tile set is really brutal on the eyes. Every time I have to go down there I feel like I'm about to get a headache. I know that some of you feel the same way because I've seen comments in the past about it. I probably won't be showing that area anymore unless it's absolutely required. Let's do a fun door transition and face Blaine. Access to Koga's badge means that every time I set up my special with growth, I'm also going to boost my speed. I'm currently not faster than the Ninetales, but I can put it to sleep on turn 1, it only went for Tail Whip, and then I can set up growth, and with 3 badge boosts, I am faster than the Ninetales. This means every time it wakes up, I can potentially put it back to sleep, continue my setup, and then sweep Flane's team. With Bulbasaur using Growth, it feels quite ironic that against the Fire-type Specialist, I am most afraid of his Normal-type moves. With my Defense Lord, moves like Stomp and Takedown will hit very hard. That being said, they might never hit because I do have Sleep Powder. I reach plus 6 attack, the Ninetales wakes up, uses Quick Attack doing a little bit of damage, but I put it back to sleep. I start attacking with Body Slam, the first one gets a critical hit bypassing my beneficial stat changes. By the way, this also bypasses the original badge boost. After setting up with Growth and getting hit by Tail Whip, my badge boosted attack stat is going to be doing more damage than a critical hit. Now the Ninetales wakes up on the next turn, and I thought I was going to do a little bit more damage, so I didn't put it back to sleep. We can see that I am doing more damage, but it's not quite enough, and then Ninetales Tails goes for Flamethrower. Luckily for me, it does not get a critical hit, so Bulbasaur survives, but it does cause a burn, which cuts my attack stat in half. Just a fun note about that, the status condition cuts your current attack stat in half, it does not recalculate based on your original attack stat. If that was the case, I would have 44 attack instead of 98, because I started the battle with 88. I finish the Ninetales off, move on to the Rapidash, which I put to sleep, and then I start using Mega Drain. This is leveraging my higher special stat, and it is also giving giving me some recovery to counter out the damage taken from burn. Because of my ridiculous setup, I'm able to finish the fire type off with only 3 hits and move on to Blaine's ace, Arcanine. I'm faster, put it to sleep, and start using Mega Drain, which is doing about a quarter, actually more like a fifth. It wakes up, I have to put it back to sleep, and in the end, Bulbasaur is able to defeat Blaine on its first attempt. I've only got 3 resets, this playthrough is going very well so far. The next major battle is against Sabrina in the Saffron City Gym. My Bulbasaur is still slower than the Abra, which is a little bit terrifying since this thing can lower your accuracy with Flash. But Sabrina can also use an X Defend. She does this right away, and I put the Abra to sleep with Sleep Powder. That gives me time to use Growth once, boosting Bulbasaur's speed to 104, and now I am going to be the one moving first. I continue my setup all the way to plus 5, where the Abra wakes up, prompting me to use Body Slam. Of course, Abra goes down to a single hit, Sabrina sends in Kadabra next, I continue attacking, and I am rewarded with a knockout. Okay, it's time for her ace, Alakazam. I wasn't sure if I was going to knock it out, but I go for the aggressive play. It survives on red health, sets up Reflect, which isn't enough to stop my next body slam from getting the knockout. Alright, so seven gym leaders are done, there is only one left. I'm going to head into the Viridian City Gym and face the two mandatory trainers. Then on my way out, I face two optional trainers just to level up to 50. 
After that, I head over to Giovanni, and here I realized that I had uh, missed something. So I head back to the warden's house to pick up a rare candy, and I also take this opportunity to journey to the power plant to grab another one, just because Bulbasaur is a first stage Pokemon, and I want to be as prepared as possible. That brings my total to 11, and I'm going to use 8 of them to boost Bulbasaur from level 50 to 58 before the final gym battle. This fight is a little bit weird. Giovanni's most intimidating Pokemon for Bulbasaur is going to be the Dugtrio. It can do a lot of damage with Dig or Earthquake, one shot with Fissure because of its speed stat, and lower my accuracy with Sand Attack. Essentially, every turn it uses a move, it's going to be doing something that is bad for me. The only way it's going to be useless is if Giovanni chooses to use a guard spec. I wanted to put it to sleep, but it hits twice, so Bulbasaur is left on orange health. That's not the worst though, because I do manage to get the status condition, and then I can set up with Gro. Dugtrio wakes up as I reach plus 5, so I go for Mega Drain to finish it off and gain back a lot of health. Next is Persian, Mega Drain one-shots again, healing Bulbasaur to full. And now we have to talk about the Nidos. Because of how the AI works, the only move they are ever going to use against Bulbasaur is either Tail Whip or Leer. This is just because the AI is checking type combinations in a really weird way. It finds that Earthquake is not very effective against the Grass typing, then it finds that Thunder is not very effective against the Grass typing, and that Double Kick is not very effective against the Poison typing. I didn't remember that against the Nidoqueen, so I put it to sleep, which is objectively just a waste of time. On the Nidoking, I remembered spamming Body Slam. Giovanni uses his signature guard spec here, and then I knock it out. All that's left is Rhydon, but of course it stands no chance against a Mega Drain. Okay, so we have made it to the final six battles of the game. The first one is the rival battle on Route 22. Since I've realized his Sand Slash is locked into Poison Sting, and it cannot status me due to my typing, I can just set up here with growth for free. Partway through this I realized that Bulbasaur was about to level up and I knocked the Sand Slash out. Then against the Execute I can put it to sleep and set up if I want. This is helpful to boost both my speed as well as my attack stat. I polish Execute off, move on to Cloister which I one shot with Mega Drain, and then it's time for Magneton. I really need this thing not to paralyze me. I go for Mega Drain and it's enough to one hit. Body Slam takes care of the Kadabra. The Flareon on the other hand survives misses Fire Spin as it did before, and I finish it off. So Bulbasaur clears Rival 6 in under an hour, and now let's see how I was able to do with it during the Elite Four. Lorelei is a bit of a mixed bag. I went for growth turn 1 here, thinking the Dugong was just going to go for rest, but he uses Aurora Beam and gets a critical hit, taking Bulbasaur from full health down to 7 HP. Okay, so that is probably like the worst case scenario for a first turn Lorelei. By the way, I went for growth one more time, which is not advisable. The Dugong uses rest. Okay, so I'm still alive. I use sleep powder to put it to sleep, and then I continue my setup. Dugong wakes up. I had to choose, do I attack or do I put it back to sleep? I go for the status, complete my setup, put it back to sleep, just for good measure, and then I use Mega Drain finishing it off, healing Bulbasaur back to green health. The Cloister is obviously a one-hit, so I'm at full health now, and then I one-shot the Slowbro as well. Excellent. Jinx is next, but it's weak physically, so Body Slam one-hits, and Mega Drain polishes off her Ace Lapras. Alright, Elite Four member one is done, so now we get to listen to some silly music while I beat this guy up. The strategy here is obvious, just set up. You don't really need to use Sleep Powder either, you can just set up Growth and then heal with Mega Drain on the Onyx. From there, it's an obvious sweep. The Machamp is probably going to survive, but like, what's it going to do to me? Is it going to use Strength? Yes, it is. Actually, decent. It does about a third before I knock it out, so that is better than this guy usually does. With him out of the way, Agatha is next, and the tension is definitely building. This battle could be very difficult for Bulbasaur, because Mega Drain is my only damage dealing move that can hit her ghost type Pokemon. I also don't want to level up mid battle to lose my badge boosts, so because of that, I am going to use two rare candies to go up to level 63 over a damage rounding threshold. Okay, so let's see how much growth can carry me during this battle. Gengar goes for Substitute right away, which doesn't block Sleep Powder. Then Agatha switches, sending in Golbat. I try to put it to sleep, but I miss, and then she just switches back to the Gengar. Alright, fine Agatha, thank you for removing your Substitute for me, that was very helpful. I set up all the way to plus 6, and then despite Mega Drain being resisted, it is doing more than a third. So I'm able to knock out the first Gengar in only 2 hits. Golbat's next, Body Slam does more than half, causing paralysis, preventing its move, and I knock it out for free. 
Hunter could cause everything to fall apart with hypnosis or a paralysis from Lick, so I'm going to put it to sleep and then knock it out with Mega Drain. I thought I was going to get a 2 hit, but I just barely don't. Agatha uses a super potion, and then I knock it out. Arbox next, I put it to sleep to prevent glare, and then I use body slam to knock it out in two turns. Okay, so it looks like Bulbasaur is going to be able to do it on its first attempt. This is feeling really good. I put the final Gengar to sleep, use Mega Drain, doing about a third. It continues sleeping, and I finish it off. So, with only three resets, Bulbasaur has made it to the final two trainers in the game. Just before Lance, I use one more rare candy, preventing the mid-battle level up, and then I teach Bulbasaur Mimic in the place of Mega Drain. I think this is going to be far better against Lance's team. First is Gyarados. I put it to sleep and set up Growth, obviously. Then I'm going to use Body Slam to finish it off, which it takes two hits. He sends in Dragoner next. I didn't really want to put it to sleep. I was a bit disappointed that Body Slam didn't knock it out, but I have nothing to fear here. Normally, I'm worried about the Dragoner's use of Thunder Wave or Thunderbolt causing paralysis. In this case, because of his AI and my typing, he is never going to use an Electric-type move. However, a status condition from the next Dragoner is possible because it's going to be prioritizing Ice Beam. I miss Sleep Powder, it luckily does not freeze me, and then I put it to sleep. After that, I use Mimic to steal Ice Beam, and now with an outrageous special stat, I am going to sweep the rest of Lance's Pokémon. The Dragonair, the Aerodactyl, as well as the Dragonite are all one hits, and with that, Bulbasaur has made it to the champion. As this fight starts, we have to go over the major update to my current moveset. I have taught Swords Dance in the place of Growth. The reason I chose to do this is because I finished the fight against Lance with 246 speed. With 126 speed at the beginning of the fight, I know that if I use Swords Dance three times, I will be faster than the champion's Alakazam, which is his fastest Pokémon when he has a Flareon on his team. Also, Swords Dance is going to synergize a little bit better with Mimic, because I can steal the first Sand Slash's Earthquake. Remember, because this thing has Poison Sting, it is really impotent, it is going to do absolutely nothing to Bulbasaur. I can essentially set up for free, mimicking Earthquake, and then using Swords Dance. I use Sleep Powder just to prevent a little bit of chip damage, I don't want to be bruised for the rest of the fight, after all, Bulbasaur has no recovery. Hey, special shout out to those people who don't like it when I use rest. You know who you are, but you should be proud of me right now. Look at this, a first playthrough, and I'm not using my favorite move. Don't worry everyone, I'm still using sleep powder when I shouldn't be. I finish the Sand Slash off, move on to the Alakazam, which Bulbasaur outspeeds as I mentioned before, and Earthquake gets the one hit. I've made some self-deprecating comments about my use of Sleep Powder throughout this fight, but it is justified here against the Champion's Executor. If you don't put it to sleep and you're a Poison type, it is going to put you to sleep with Hypnosis. While this isn't the scariest thing in the world, because both Barrage and Stomp do not do that much damage, it does waste a lot of time. Finally, I managed to put the Executor to sleep, and then I use Body Slam and, uh, putting it to sleep was totally not justified. <laughs> I should have just knocked this thing out right away. When I was doing this playthrough, I was definitely remembering growth rather than Swords Dance. Following that is Magneton, which Bulbasaur one hits. That feels really good. Then Cloyster comes out. I put it to sleep because it's going to survive at least one hit, and I don't want to get frozen by Ice Beam. Earthquake takes it to orange, and then I knock it out on the next turn, moving on to the final Pokemon Flareon. I have speed, Earthquake hits, and obviously one shots. So, in my first playthrough with Bulbasaur, I was able to get a time of 1 hour, 7 minutes, and 27 seconds, with 3 resets at level 66. This is a game time of 4 hours and 22 minutes. For a first stage Pokemon in a first playthrough, this is honestly a really good result. I was a little bit disappointed with the fact that it only had three resets, just because I wasn't sure how much wiggle room that gave me for optimizations. If the run had 25 resets, I would know that there were so many opportunities for me to save time, but with Bulbasaur I just couldn't really see where those were. Of course, in moments when you're not sure what to do, the best thing to do is ask for help. And that is exactly what I did. I made a channel in my solo running Discord, and then then I challenged everyone to run Bulbasaur as well and share strategies. On the very first day this channel was live, people already started clocking in with better times than I was able to get. Aksu Kerry Sora got a time of 1 hour 2 minutes and 56 seconds and said a sub hour Bulbasaur time is definitely possible. Austin chimed in saying, I agree, some level up XP manipulation and take away about 15 or so sleep powder misses and this is easily sub hour. His time was an hour and 4 minutes and 27 seconds. 
If you're confused why my time was so much higher than these two first playthrough results that they were able to get, the reason is is that my mid-game training was just very poorly optimized when I did my first attempt. So now let's get into footage of the optimized Balbasar playthrough. For this one I have to give a huge thanks to Austin for his help with optimizations, and for a key piece of insight which was critical for achieving a great time with Balbasar. I'll talk about that as soon as I've cleared Brock. For him, I am once again going to be using Vine Whip to defeat his Rock-type Pokémon, however I am going to get to Vine Whip in a very different way. Inside the forest I find a single Pidgey and knock it out. This levels Bulbasaur up from level 6 to level 7. This is very important, because if you level up from level 6 to level 8 and skip a level, your Pokémon will not learn the move that it learns at the previous level. So if I had fought the mandatory Bug Catcher at the end of the forest, I would have leveled up to level 8 and missed Leech Seed, and I really want to have Leech Seed. The reason is, this move really helps against the mandatory Bug Catcher. His level 10 Caterpie is actually kind of intimidating for Bulbasaur, and the ability to gain back health every turn means that I don't have to save before this battle, or just restart the playthrough if I lose, which is always painful. I used 3 growls to minimize Caterpie's damage. If you use 4, 5, or 6 it will not actually make it do less damage, so that's just wasted time. After defeating the Caterpie, my Bulbasaur levels up to level 8, and then in Pewter City I'm gonna face the Junior Trainer. I'm doing this for blackout experience, I want to knock out the Diglett, and then get knocked out myself by the Santru, so I can repeat the process and gain the trainer boosted experience again. Starting at the beginning of 2024, I will be adding a blackouts metric to account for these kind of scenarios. For now, I don't have that, and the reset counter is not going to increment, because this is going according to plan. After four blackouts, my goal is to defeat the junior trainer. By the way, he does end up knocking me out here for a fifth time. That wasn't according to the plan, so I am going to increment the reset counter here, because that's considered a fail. I come back and defeat him in the next attempt, earning Vine Whip, and then I can completely smash Brock. Okay, so is everyone ready to get very specific with the trainers that I'm going to fight in the next section of the game? Because this is very important. On Route 3, I fight the Bug Catcher, Youngster, Lass, and then Final Bug Catcher. Inside of Mount Moon, I fight the Bug Catcher with Weedle and Kakuna, the Super Nerd, the Bug Catcher just north of the Rare Candy, the Lass, and then the Rocket down the first ladder, which I very rarely fight, he has a Sandshrew. I use an Escape Rope to go back to the Mount Moon Poké Center where I can heal, and then come back into the cave to do more training. I continue by fighting the Rocket by Mega Punch, the Youngster, the Hiker, and then the Rocket on my way towards the Mandatory Super Nerd and Jesse and James. Then in the Cerulean City Gym, I'm level 22, I fight the Swimmer as well as the Goldie trainer, leveling Bulbasaur up to level 23. Of course Misty is straightforward, I have a 2 hit on the Staryu, and then a 3 hit on the Starmie. I would understand right now if you were thinking that this is way too much training and that I'm going to tank Bulbasaur's time. Why is this guy not just doing Brock on minimum battles? No, 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 that's not a good idea. I want to level up as fast as I can in the early game. And this is the key piece of insight that Austin was able to provide to me. Bulbasaur wants to get to Razor Leaf as fast as is possible. Once it obtains it, the rest of the game is just going to speed by. Defeating the rival on Nugget Bridge does not level Bulbasaur up, so it's still level 24, but then the first bug catcher on Nugget Bridge levels me up to 25. At this point in the playthrough, I have collected two rare candies, and I'm going to use both of them now to get Razor Leaf right before the next last. The reason this is important is because her Pidgey can really mess things up for you by going for Sand Attack, plus the Nidoran female takes forever to knock out if you're using Tackle. With Razor Leaf on the other hand, there is a 65% chance to one-hit both of these Pokémon. More one-hits means increased consistency, less time spent in battles, and less saves because I'm not as worried. The next two optional battles I do are on the SSN, the first one is to obtain the TM for Body Slam, and the second one is to get the Rare Candy past the Gentleman. I am going to need this, rare candies are very important to make everything work in the late game. We're going to skip Surge because he's completely useless, and head to the other side of Lavender Town. This is Route 8, and I'm going to fight one optional trainer here, the Gambler who has the Poliwag line. This fight is great for experience, and it's very fast because it can use Vine Whip and Razor Leaf to knock all his Pokémon out in a single hit. I continue fighting optional battles, taking out two rockets in the hideout, one to gain access to the area, and the other one to get double team and a nugget. This money allows me to buy three Carbos, which are going to be important in the mid game. In Pokemon Tower, I want to mention growth, because I am not going to teach it to Bulbasaur at all during this playthrough. Upon reflection, Swords Dance is the superior choice throughout the entire game. Growth just slows the run down in so many different ways. 
After clearing Pokemon Tower, I go to the Safari Zone, fighting no optional trainers, and then I head into Sylph. Here I fight the guy with Machoke to get access to the rare candy and then the mandatory Arbok trainer. This gives me access to the card key, and then I can kind of loop around on this floor to this teleport pad, which takes me right here. I can fight this trainer, who has two ground-type Pokemon, and then obtain the TM for Swords Dance. With this setup move in Erika's gym, I can face the Cool Trainer. One Swords Dance gives one hits on all three of her Pokemon, plus she gives great experience yields. And all of this experience is building towards something, because once I defeat Erika, the two mandatory jugglers in Koga's gym, as well as one optional tamer, Bulbasaur is level 40. I can use 5 rare candies to get it up to level 45 before I face Koga. If you think this level is overkill against Koga, it really isn't. I have a 77% chance to knock out the Venomoth in one hit with Body Slam, with full setup from Swords Dance. Also do note that it outspeeds Bulbasaur, and Psychic does between 70 and 83% damage without a critical hit. Bulbasaur needs to get the one hit. But in this case I don't, giving the Venomoth a chance to win, but it just goes for Leech Life again, I survive, and and defeat Koga. Next I face the rival in Sylph, I can set up for free against the Sand Slash, I only need two uses of Sword Stance, and then I can sweep his team. If you remember the three Carbos that I purchased, this is where they are useful because Bulbasaur has one more speed than the Kadabra. The next major battle is Blaine, and to prepare for this one I use three more rare candies. If I had gone into this fight at level 47, and then set up Sword Stance fully, I would have a 42% chance to one-hit the Ninetales, an 89% chance to one-hit the Rapidash, and only a 93% chance to two-hit the Arcanine. However, with three rare candies, I have a 91% chance on both the Ninetales and the Rapidash, and a guaranteed two-hit on the Arcanine. Once again in this fight, no resets for Bulbasaur, so essentially this is a reset-free playthrough. The only one on the counter right now is that blackout against the junior trainer that I really didn't want to have. I have to face Sabrina next. This fight is a bit frustrating because there's nothing I can do to optimize it further. I just have to get lucky here. Granted, she isn't very good, so that's not that hard, and once again, no resets for Bulbasaur. In Giovanni's gym, I only face the mandatory trainers, and of course the battle against him is simple as long as I luck out against the Doug Trio, which is what happens here. Alright, as I go up against the rival on Route 22, let's check in with the clock. Right now it is approaching 43 minutes. 43 minutes and Bulbasaur is here. This thing is so good. And you can see that during this fight. It honestly just crushes the rival. And by the way, that is not going to stop. Against Lorelei, I put the Dugong to sleep and then set up with Swords Dance. After that, I have a 69% chance to knock out the Cloister in a single hit using Razor Leaf. I have an 84% chance on the Slowbro, so I put it to sleep with Sleep Powder first to play safe and then knock it out. Jinx goes down to a single Body Slam, and then I have to play safe again against the Lapras, putting it to sleep and finishing it with two uses of Body Slam. Alright, so it's time to face Agatha, and for this one I'm going to use my most recent Victory Bell strategy, which is to teach Mimic in the place of Razor Leaf. What this allows me to do is put the first Gengar to sleep, and then set up with Sword Stance, and after that, I can mimic Lick, which is a physical move, and use this against all of the ghosts. It's worth noting that Lick isn't doing very much damage, like Mega Drain is roughly comparable, but I have to use a physical move in this case since I'm running Sword Stance. There is the possibility that I lose to Agatha if I miss a Sleep Powder on the Haunter or the Gengar and get put to sleep with Hypnosis. But like all the other fights in this run, Bulbasaur is fine, it makes it through with no resets, and now it's time to face Lance. For this fight I use one rare candy going up to level 58, and now when I badge boost I want you to pay attention to my speed stat, it maxes out at 174. So I'm gonna move first against the Aerodactyl. So the fight's simple, knock out both the Gyarados and the Dragonair with Body Slam, mimic Ice Beam, and then sweep his final three Pokemon. Bulbasaur has arrived at the champion before 50 minutes. It just might be able to pull off a sub 50 minute time and earn itself a spot in the A tier. I'm going to be playing this champion fight the same way that I played the previous one, so Body Slam, Swords Dance, Sleep Powder, and Earthquake. I do want you to note that I put the Executor to sleep. While it is fine to just attack it, I didn't want to crit and then fail to knock it out, and I actually do crit the first turn I attack it, so I'm glad I had sleep. I finish the Magneton off with Earthquake, and then I use Sleep Powder on the Cloister, but it wakes up right away. Okay, this is the one Pokemon that really does need to go to sleep. I go for Sleep Powder again, but it misses. Cloister uses Aurora Beam, gets a critical hit, and Bulbasaur faints. That's a very disappointing reset. If we jump back into the next fight, I'm defeating the Executor, and if you look at the clock, Bulbasaur is unfortunately not going to finish under 50 minutes. But it's going to be very close. I put the Cloister to sleep, knock it out with two hits, 
Flareon is last, it goes down to Earthquake, and Bulbasaur clocks in with a final time of 50 minutes and 16 seconds, with two resets at level 60. This is a game time of 3 hours and 15 minutes. In this playthrough, the time that I was chasing was Austin's most recent time, 49 minutes and 57 seconds, so he was able to get Bulbasaur sub 50 minutes. But I was unfortunately just not quite able to do it. That being said, I don't want to paint these results badly because Bulbasaur's finish time is exceptional, especially for a first stage Pokemon. Right now the top ranked first stage Pokemon is Ghastly with a time of 47 minutes and 28 seconds. Bulbasaur wasn't even 3 minutes slower than that. I think when put in that context, we can see how impressive this thing really is. Its time today is the second best first stage Pokemon that I have done so far, and it earns a spot at the top of the B tier just ahead of Flareon. Of course, right now we are in Daily December so I'm going to come back tomorrow to do another Pokemon Yellow video. And this one is going to be with the Fire-type starter. So we're going to find out how Charmander does in a solo playthrough of Pokemon Yellow. Thanks so much for watching, I hope you enjoyed this video, and now as a small treat for everyone who's stuck around, let's face Professor Oak. Contrasting all of the previous battles, this one is actually difficult for Bulbasaur. I try to take on the Oak team that is going to be strongest against the Pokemon that I'm using, and that is largely why this one is problematic. If I was fighting the Blastoise team or the Venusaur team, this would not nearly be as difficult. There are two contributing factors. The first one is Mimic doesn't really have a good target. In the fights against Agatha, Lance, and the Champion, there was always a good move to steal, but my best options here are usually Hypnosis or Stomp, and Bulbasaur's current set already has better alternatives. The second factor is that when Oak has Charizard, he has two fire types. The Arcanine is not problematic because I have badge boosts allowing me to outspeed, but when I move on to the Charizard, my Bulbasaur levels up, so we either have to wait until I survive a hit from Flamethrower or Fire Spin misses. I don't like to do additional training before this fight, so that's the situation I am stuck in. In this case, accuracy is my path to victory, I put the Charizard to sleep, and then I knock it out. From there I still haven't won because I have a speed tie with the Gyarados and it could knock me out. In this case it just goes for Leer, so I put it to sleep and knock it out. If you made it this far, you're incredible, Daily December continues tomorrow with a playthrough of Charmander. I'll see you then.